There, there are no vegan rapists in the prisons of the world. You, you go find me a vegan rapist. I'd love to hear about a story. I'll show you prisons around the world full of meat, dairy, and egg-eating rapists and child molesters and murderers and people that rob and steal. In fact, I'll even take it a step further when we talk about health. Go find me a hospital with a bunch of sick vegans in it. I'll show you hospitals full of people with heart disease, cancers, diabetes, osteoporosis, kidney problems, etc. All stemming from animal protein, the main cause of every major disease on this planet. Welcome to the Cannabis Vegan. I'm Jason Lodge. On today's show, we're going to be looking at a mother and son that has changed the medical cannabis laws in New York today and in the future, as well as giving thanks to some vegan YouTubers, Vegan Talk, and Ask Yourself. This and more on The Cannabis Vegan. you have a cell phone and you have a computer it is unfair to pick one thing that lions do that you want to mimic when you don't want to mimic anything else they do when lions walk up and greet each other they sniff each other's ass when i came in this room you did not kneel down and sniff my ass i'd like to say that uh creating the natural label is an art uh, but it's not <laughs> it's just not your product may contain uh growth hormones and antibiotics just throw that word natural on there Maybe add a picture of a barn. Your product may be uh, very heavily processed, but <gasps> what? A barn? <gasps> it works every time. Hi, my name is Mark, and I'm with Funky Skunk Extracts. Today, we're going to show you a few different ways to make hatches. Hatch is a concentrated form of cannabis. We take the cannabinoids and we separate them from the plant material. Here at Funky Skunk, we use a dry sift method, which then we later press into pressed hash. Our hash is different than BHO and other solvent-based extractions in that we don't use a solvent. It's entirely mechanical and uses different temperatures to extract the cannabinoids from the plant material. First, I'll demonstrate the dry sift screen method. We always start with properly cured frozen material. It's important to get your temperature as low as possible because frozen trichomes will break off their stock and separate from the plant material more easily. Once you get your material on the screen, you just start breaking it up and spreading it around. Wax on, wax off. Dry sifting on a screen is a very delicate process. You're not going for quantity, you're going for quality, and you should expect a very low return. But as long as you're being careful, it should be a very high quality. Next, I'll demonstrate the dry ice method. For this method, you want to combine your plant material with about 40% dry ice. Dry ice is five times colder than regular ice at about negative 109 degrees Fahrenheit. These super cold temperatures, combined with friction caused by shaking the bag, will cause the trichomes to break off their stalks and fall into the collection vessel below. And that's what we're looking for, folks. Now, the longer we shake, the more plant material will break up and make its way through the screen contaminating your teeth. This is why old school methods of making hash are as much of an art form as they are a science. It takes practice working with different strains to get the feel for the right kind of stock. Obviously, you want to maximize yield without sacrificing quality. And when we're satisfied with our shake, it's time to collect. Here, you can really see the difference in quality between our two methods. The dry sift is a beautiful golden color, whereas the dry ice cube has been contaminated with some plant material, making it green. Next. It's time to turn the keef into hash. To do this, we fill up our 8 ton hash press with our keef. The traditional method is to wrap the keef in plastic wrap and layers of wet newspaper. Then, alternating between heating the brick slowly on a hot plate and rolling it with a rolling pin, sometimes for hours to achieve the correct consistency. But we found our press to be a much faster approach. We simply jack it up like we're changing a tire, and in just a few minutes, we're done. You can see by its dark and shiny surface that the trichomes have melted together. Once we break it open, we see the gooey Play-Doh consistency and the beautiful golden brown color that we're looking for. And here's our final product, the hash brick. Every time we make hash, we learn something new, 
Every strain is different. Every trichome head size is different. Also, the environmental factors can play into the end result. The more we make it, the better we get. I learned how to make hash mostly from the internet, as well as a lot of trial and error. I'd like to thank Bubble Man, as well as Soil Grown, and many other people for posting videos just like this one where I learned how to do it. You can pick up Funky Skunk Hash at multiple I-502 retail locations in Whatcom, Skagit, and King County. To find out more, check us out online at sugarleafarm.com. Well, everybody, welcome to today's show. Before we really dive too deep into it, I just want to say thank you to all the vegans out there. A very big thank you to all the hard workers in all the areas that we are definitely making a lot of headway, but there's a lot of work to be done. Um, I truly thank you. And just want to give a, a few seconds of uh, our heads down and just give thanks. Here we go, guys. All right, guys. Everybody, I want to introduce you to Vegan Talk. Very, very inspirational man. Uh, Matthew has really shown what he can do as an individual, him and his friends, and uh, bringing the awareness around. And uh, I really, what really brought me to him is his overall attitude and how he likes to break down information. I really like breaking down information myself, seeing information, and seeing a very good friend like this makes me very happy to know that we're we're very, very in the same boat, but we're very close to each other here in California, and if people want to gather together and make a difference, let me know, contact the Cannabis Vegan, leave your comments, questions down below, and let's really change this for everybody. Um... Well, without further ado, let's go ahead and jump right into it. Why do we categorize animals the way that we do? Why do we call dogs family and chickens food? What is it that determines an animal's worth? To view one as subject and the other as object. Is it a measure of intelligence? Is it a measure of an animal's ability to feel pain? Let's explore these questions and more in today's episode of Vegan Talk. <laughs> So how do we categorize animals? Dr. Margot DeMello addresses this in her book, Animals in Society. She brings focus on a specific animal, rabbits, and discusses the various relationships that we have with them. Depending on the rabbit, the quality of life for these animals can be either overwhelmingly loving or completely excruciating. This is because rabbits play many different roles in regards to their relationship to human beings. We have rabbits as pets. We hunt rabbit for sport. We use rabbits for food. We breed rabbits for fur. And we use rabbits as research tools for experimentation. So what differences exist within these animals that help us determine their fate? How do we decide which rabbit goes off to a loving family and which rabbit gets sent off to the lab? The answer, nothing really. Biologically speaking, all these animals are the same. Like humans, rabbits don't have any subspecies, so regardless of differentiating characteristics like color, fur length, and size, all rabbits share the same foundational genetic makeup. And yet, regardless of this fact, we have animal cruelty laws in place that protect the rabbits that bear the title pet, while at the same time having laws in place that rejects the exact same animal as even being a living creature when under the title research tool. Understanding this, the value of an animal has very little to do with their biology and nearly everything to do with the functional role that we've assigned them within society. 
It's not an animal's cognitive ability or physical identity that determines their value. It's what they symbolically represent within the culture that they live in that does. Absolutely amazing. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Matthew, for really breaking it down, showing what you can do and what others can do. And I encourage you guys to visit him. Hop on over to his YouTube here, as well as hop on over to his uh, website at vegantalk.tumblr and check out some of his other postings, as well as go to his uh, Facebook and check out this absolutely amazing footage that he has. And he's got a lot of things coming down the pipeline himself. But what I really am uh, wanting to encourage you guys is to let him know. Let him know that the Cannabis Vegan told you to say hi and love what you're doing. Also, come on down to here and check out this video. We're going to go ahead and check it out ourselves. The trolley problem is a classic thought experiment about complicated human ethics. The standard trolley problem supposes that there are five people tied to a train track and can't escape. A trolley is rapidly approaching them, kill them all. You are standing next to a lever that can divert the trolley down a second track and save all five people. But there's a catch. On the other track, there's one person tied up. So by saving five people, you'd be killing one person instead. What would you do? Most people's first reaction is that they would pull the lever and save as many people as possible. The problem becomes more complicated when it's revealed that the person on the second track is not just a random person, but a close family member. People are suddenly less willing to save five strangers in order to kill one family member. It's quite the ethical dilemma. Well, I've got a new twist on the trolley problem. Imagine on the original track, instead of five people, there's a bunch of animals chickens, a turkey, a pig, a cow, etc. And the train is fast approaching to kill all of them. Would you pull the lever to save them? I know what you're thinking. Who's on the second track? Well, here's the catch. No one. Nothing. There's no person and no animal anywhere on the second track. All I'm asking is, would you pull the lever to save these helpless animals? There'll be no victims or consequences for pulling the lever. What would you do? You'd pull the lever, wouldn't you? Now, what if I told you that this wasn't just some hypothetical lever? That this is a real choice that you can make every day and save real helpless animals? Pulling the lever is called eating a plant-based vegan diet. And if you do it for a year, you save around 200 animal lives, land and sea animals. No victims, no sacrifice, just a choice and a little extra thought and planning. If you don't pull the lever and eat a standard diet, more helpless animals die. Think about it. Give this video a thumbs up if you'll pull the lever in real life, or give it a thumbs down if you let things take a standard course. The choice is yours, but the choice is real. Are you feeling an ethical dilemma? Interesting. We really need to share this information with others, really take in the sentient beings of the fact that they are all around us and they are much more than just friends. They are family, they are this universe, as you are and everything else. Okay, moving on. Also, make sure you hop on over to his official teamgreen.com website and check them out there. Drop them a line. Let them know that the Cannabis Vegan sent you. And learn a little bit more about what he's done in the past, present, and in the future. Make sure you guys go to his Twitter as well. This and more on the and next really Cannabis Vegan. really deep with his information. Check out what's going on. This particular one caught my eye. I was very interested to see things like that. And we need to make sure that if anybody is going to promote anything about zoos, make sure you're promoting the facts, the logic of it. Show exactly what our family is seeing. Not these, these monsters. Okay? And we need to change those monsters into good people. Because you know what? It's not them that's the monster. It's their actions.
and what they're doing that they obviously don't understand. For those that do understand, well, yes. Bad, bad choices must be upon you when you choose things like that upon others. Think about that. Okay, guys. I encourage you guys to visit him and just uh, give him a little jingle. Let him know that what we are all doing is pushing forward. Please, guys. More to come. He's a vegan lifestyle, morally superior. I have to confess I'm not a vegan. I have to confess that I need to be more Well, it feels a little odd to kick off my channel by criticizing someone who I respect. Not even just respect. I love Dawkins. But his response to that question says a lot about the state of things. It's currently considered normal to ingest the remains of murdered animals. Right now, this barbaric insanity is so commonplace that not only are many of the smartest among us blind to it, even people like Dawkins, who've dedicated their lives to exposing and destroying dogma, are often unaware that the presumed morality of animal use is a dogma. Now, to be fair, I will give Dawkins some credit for that response, because an acknowledgement of the moral superiority of veganism is certainly better than most of the madness I hear when veganism is mentioned. We could place his response on a spectrum, somewhere between immediately going vegan and claiming that veganism is just another lifestyle choice. This delusional behavior isn't restricted to the smartest among us either. It can also be found among the most ethical. I can't tell you how many spiritual types I've met who preach compassion while supporting a policy of eternal global genocide for animals. So why is it that smart, compassionate people still support this cruel, ancient bullshit? Well, in one word, indoctrination. We live in a world where speciesism and animal exploitation are deeply embedded. Animal use was part of our society long before complex moral structures arose. Whole cultures and civilizations developed without serious debate on the moral legitimacy of animal use. All right, everybody. I encourage you guys to hop on over to Ask Yourself's channel on YouTube, and I'll send the links down below. Uh, thank you, brother. Good on you for really coming out right off the bat and getting right to work. I want everyone else to take note of this. Um, ask yourself, what can you do to help push this and yourself even further? And I thank you for pushing forward. It's really made a impression into my heart and really going to continue to push on. More to come from the Cannabis Vegan. I love dogs. They truly are natural's best friend. You never hear a dog say, There better not be any genetically modified organisms in my food. They can't read labels. They have no legal rights, and their owners will spend a fortune on them. Again, enjoy that all-natural, meaty meatness. We can't legally call it meat. You are going to make me a fortune. Well, as we jump into this next story, we can clearly look at the New York is just really pushing forward with their cannabis medical and it really shows that a lot of people are going to have help really soon. It really makes a difference for everybody to get involved, to do the research, and to get the testing done. But I also want to bring light to a situation to a mother and son that have really paved the path for New York in itself, for them to have what they have today being launched. Looking back at the 7th, you can clearly see with it being launched, it was really amazing to see how much is really pushed through. Why don't we take a moment to look at it? And finally tonight, New York's medical marijuana program goes into effect Thursday. The new law is considered one of the nation's strictest with limits placed on the way cannabis can be ingested and who has access to it. Kate Rogers gives us an exclusive look inside one of the dispensaries in Manhattan. While New York State's medicinal marijuana startups are all gearing up to open their doors on January 7th, Columbia Care may have the buzziest location of them all. The reason? It's right off of Union Square in New York City, set to be Manhattan's first medicinal marijuana dispensary under the 2014 Compassionate Care Act. 
The dispensary features tight security with five outside cameras and patient verification necessary before even stepping inside. Once patients get through the doors, they'll enter this modern, pristine waiting area, but you might notice it's not sterile like a doctor's office. Instead, the goal here is to maximize patient comfort. We have tried to create an environment where patients feel welcome, they feel warm, they feel safe, uh, and they feel like they're having a very professional experience. Under New York State's medicinal marijuana laws, five companies were awarded licenses to grow and manufacture as well as sell products. All cannabis must be grown in this state, and each company is licensed to open four dispensaries. Patients can only seek treatment if they have one of 10 illnesses approved by the state's Department of Health, including cancer, ALS, AIDS or HIV, and Parkinson's. Columbia Care has operations in Washington, D.C. and Arizona, and will be expanding into Illinois, Massachusetts, and San Diego, California later in the year. But opening in New York is a symbolic step. It really sets the tone for policy, for, you know, for, for enlightenment, for intellectual uh, curiosity and innovation. But don't expect this company to expand into the recreational space. Instead, Columbia Care is intent on expanding patient access in New York and beyond. So as we look further to the situations, we can clearly see that that is what holds in for the future. And I'll keep you updated as it comes along. But let's go ahead and really dive deeper medical cannabis program and laws overall. This is Oliver Miller. I'm from Atlantic Beach, New York. Oliver had a stroke in utero, and as a result, he has what's called a brain stem injury. So he has a lot of very complex medical problems. Among them are seizures that do not respond like this. Okay. 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 All right. You okay. Okay. All right. All right, come back now. That's what we call a brain zap seizure. <laughs> Certain strains of marijuana have received international attention for curbing seizures in children. Oliver has not been able to access this form of treatment. His mother, Missy, was not alone in her fight. Within the last decade, there has been a major push from citizens and activists across the United States to legalize medical marijuana. With 22 states having legalized the drug for medicinal usage, the spotlight turned to New Yorkers who have rallied behind the Compassionate Care Act, which would eventually make New York the 23rd state to legalize medical marijuana. There has been a tradition of medical marijuana in New York City under the radar for 25 years. And now we are this close to bringing it above the radar. Don't drop this ball. Earlier this year, Missy sat down with Elite Daily to discuss her frustrations with the current New York political system and her fear of losing her son. You know, you can talk politics, you can talk money. The bottom line is you can help people. You can save lives. You can give people a better quality of life. It's, it's what should be done. The federal government regulates marijuana as a Schedule I drug. Now, Schedule I drugs are drugs that have no medical benefit uh, and that are often highly addictive. So you're talking about classing it in a class with heroin. It is classified at a higher, more intense level than things like methamphetamine, which is a Schedule II drug. You know, there, there are some questionable, questionable motives with the government that are going to be brought up and addressed. And I think within five, seven years, it will all be legal federally on a medical level. My problem is Oliver doesn't have five years. I don't know that Oliver has one year. Over the next few months, Missy rallied together with other parents whose children were also in need of help. They urged local politicians to meet their children to understand the importance of passing the bill. Missy turned her attention to New York Senator Dean Skelos, who represents her district, even launching a local commercial campaign. Senator Skelos, please don't make us wait another year. Allow a vote on the Compassionate Care Act. She continued her fight up to Albany, leading up to the big decision on June 19th. Medical marijuana has the capacity to do a lot of good for a lot of people who are in pain and who are suffering. We were in Albany Wednesday and Thursday 
We heard Thursday morning that they had reached an agreement with the governor, and then we were in the press conference when the governor made the announcement that he was going to be approving this bill. Some of these cases are the most uh, heart-wrenching cases you've ever heard. You're dealing with children, children with epilepsy, babies. The next day, I had gotten a phone call very early in the morning from Senator Skelos's office asking me if I was still in Albany. And I said, no, we had to come home. Oliver was having too many seizures. He was too unstable. And then they called back and they said he would like you to watch the vote. If you were to tell me at the beginning of this session that I would be voting yes on this legislation, I would say to you, no way. And then when he said... But when you meet Oliver Miller from my district, 14 years old, and some of the folks here mentioned that they have 10, 12 seizures a day, he has hundreds of seizures a day because as a result of a pre-birth stroke. Calling out my son's name, like, on the Senate floor, like, he basically, you know, was just saying, like, you know what, this little boy changed my mind. That's worth voting for, the, for this legislation. I was so proud of Oliver, because <laughs> I felt like Oliver is helping thousands of people. The bill is passed. Governor Cuomo signed the measure into law Saturday, July 5th, and held a formal signing ceremony in New York City on July 7th to highlight the new law. It makes total sense for New York State to take this advancement in medical marijuana. A tremendous weight has been lifted. This step has lifted, you know, the biggest, biggest hurdle right out of the way. So we're very hopeful. But a lot of people look at Oliver or children like Oliver and think, you know, what, what do they contribute? You know, why, do they, if they're here with all these problems, what do they, and Oliver really has contributed. Okay, all right, okay. And hopefully we can stop these. Okay, good. We've been living under a collective delusion where eliminating sleep from our lives is a sort of um, express elevator to the top. It's so powerful sitting listening to stories about people who have like, who've lost so much, lost so many friends. I met Carrie Hammer at a United Cerebral Palsy luncheon. I remember Carrie's first comment to me. She commented on my Louis Vuitton booties that I was wearing, and she called me the Carrie Bradshaw of people in wheelchairs. Wow, everybody. That was absolutely inspirational to see um, Oliver really have his challenges, but for everybody to go, be able to push through changing laws, being able to see progress. Um, being able to help others that may or may not have some of the same situations that everybody faces. Also, let's take a moment to look at the other reports that we have out of New York as well. As you saw on the 6th, well, we basically have the first look at the inside. It was being released on the 7th, being grand opening. And then, of course, we come up to the 8th, where we have another little note to pass on that basically it still is going to be the only kosher place around and to see these things coming out and around it's still very very new and i'm really glad that we can continue to show these things until we have the vegan cannabis vegan symbol on it to be completely kosher because that what that is going to entail a full spectrum diagnosis of all potency, residues, uh, mildews, micro, everything. It's the full spectrum. And that's what we're shooting for. But for now, to see something as nice as the kosher, well, that's a step in the right direction. So obviously we're pushing forward. Well, guys, for more on this, go to 420intel.com. And there's more coming down from the Cannabis Vegan. You put a two-year-old child in a crib with a bunny rabbit and an apple? Let me know when the child eats the bunny rabbit and plays with the apple.
cell phone, you need a computer. It is only fair to pick one thing that lions do that you want to mimic. When you don't want to mimic anything else they do. When lions walk up and greet each other, they sniff each other's ass. When I came in this room, you did not kneel down and sniff my ass. 